Hey guys, I am so sorry about what happened with this last YouTube live stream. I was all set to go, and then when I pressed go live, it just showed me a black screen with a circle spinning for about 10 minutes. I tried a bunch of other ways to try to get my stream up, but nothing was working. I think it's the hospital's internet. Yes, I am in the hospital again. This time with issues, my central line, there's my central line. Right here is my central line. Um, my central line is my lifeline. I get all of my nutrition, hydration, and most of my medication through my central line. And I have at least two or three bags running through it 24-7. It's also how I get blood draws and a lot of my treatments. So this is a really big deal. Because I'm in the hospital, I may need to pause at some points during the video if a nurse or an aide needs to come in and provide care, and I apologize for that in advance. But here is Chapter 11 of Saving Destiny. We start off with Destiny's viewpoint. She's on the second day of her, of her 12 to 18 month stay at the Jackson Center a residential treatment center for kids with mental health issues. Here we go, here's Destiny. The next morning, I woke up and forgot where I was until I saw the staff sitting in my doorway and remembered that I was at the Jackson Center. I got dressed, said going down, and went downstairs. Hi, a tall older woman, at least in her 60s, greeted me. My name is Becky. I'm the morning staff around here. Hi, I greeted her. I'm going to take you girls over to the school building. Oh, sorry guys. For the summer program soon, she explained to me. The other girls were eating breakfast. I asked to see what drinks my mom had sent down for me and selected a Lipton's sugar-free citrus green iced tea then sat down at the table with the other girls who were eating their breakfast. A different nurse named Ida came by to give us our morning medications. Before she crushed them all up to put through my J-tube, the nurse pointed out to me that I was on a new medication called Lamictal. It's a mood stabilizing medication to help you deal a little better with your mood swings. Dr. Tanner, the psychiatrist here, wanted to try you on it. Hesitantly, I handed the pill back so that she could crush it and put it through my tube, but thought it was weird that the doctor here was prescribing me medication before he actually met me. Still, I was so determined that I would do super well and get sent home early, so I allowed her to push it through with all my other laundry list of medications before asking too many other questions. The on-call overnight nurse had disconnected me from my tube feed an hour earlier and given me my thyroid medication through my J-tube. So Ida had the pump for my feeding tube and the backpack in the staff office with all of my feeding tube supplies. She had already set everything up, but wanted me to look it over and make sure everything looked right before hooking me up to it. I grabbed the pump and pressed a few buttons going through it to look at all the settings. Surprisingly, she had done it right. It looks good, I told her. She was, so she hooked me up to the backpack and sent me on my way. The bag was always so heavy in the morning. After all of us girls were ready, Becky walked us across the street to the school building. Tanya and Kayla made up with a couple of staff and got in vans. The girls that have been here a while get to do summer jobs off grounds as part of the summer program, Becky explained to me. Lydia goes to the summer camp with the middle school and elementary school kids. Since you and Kat just got here, your summer jobs will be on grounds. Kat works in the snack shop. When we got the, when we got over to the school, when we get over to the school, they'll let you know what your summer job will be. We get paid, Kat told me. $20 a week. That sounded good to me. Who doesn't like money? Even though I liked the idea of getting money, once we got to the school building, I felt myself getting a little nervous. 
My lips were so dry. Anxiously, I kept running my tongue over my lips. I tried to remember to breathe. Becky led me to the staff office. Hey guys, this is Destiny. She just got here yesterday. She's supposed to be part of the summer program, summer work program. Becky introduced me. There were three people in the staff office. The shorter woman, who I originally thought was a man with a short haircut and wearing a very masculine looking sweater and jeans, introduced herself as Gina. We're called timeout staff, Gina explained to me. If you ever need to take a voluntary timeout while you're at school or a summer program, you can come here and we'll try to help you calm down so that you can go back to class or summer program. Sometimes we help kids that get sent here for misbehaving as well, but we're just here to help. I'll call down to Liz to find out where you're supposed to go for a summer work program, Ravi, the sk- tall, skinny timeout staff, told me. Christina, the third timeout staff with curly red hair, smiled and waved at me. I nodded and stood there, fidgeting with the bow around Blinky's neck. Well, these guys will help you out, so I'm going to go back to the house. I'll see you tomorrow morning, Becky told me. I said bye to Becky and waited for this Liz woman to show up. Liz arrived a few minutes after Becky had left. Hey, you must be Destiny, she smiled at me enthusiastically. I'm Liz. I'm the head of the summer job program. I don't know exactly what would be a good fit for you because I don't know you that well yet. But we have an opening in the horticulture program. And Lori, who is in charge of that program, is the sweetest woman ever. She will be very patient and accommodating with you, she told me. What's horticulture, I asked. All I could think about was Harry Potter waving a magic wand over a potted plant while telling Ron about a good idea about how he'd have he'd had about how to save the magical world. It's basically gardening and keeping up the grounds, Liz explained to me. You'll work with Lori and one of the kids from the boys' house and a student who's just a, and a boy who's just a student at the day school. You'll work every day all morning, and then after lunch you'll have school classes. I liked my imaginary version of horticulture better than this. This seemed like a bit of a letdown. Cat said something about getting paid, I mentioned. Hopefully. Yeah, you can get up to $20 a week. Lori will fill out your point card and evaluation. And if you get all your points, you get the full $20. If you lose points, you'll get money deducted, Liz explained to me. Do you have any questions? Not right now, I told her. Okay, well, I'll bring you over to Lori then. Liz smiled. I followed Liz out of the the school building to her garden in the back. Liz introduced me to Lori and the two boys who were working on digging holes in a dirt patch. Lori showed me how to dig the hole a few inches deep and then put one of the small tomato plants in the hole and cover it up. I planted a bunch of tomato plants. It was kind of fun at first, but the sun beating down on my head was starting to make me a little dizzy. I kept planting anyway. I liked Lori. I wanted to make her happy. Plus, I was still determined to be the model patient and set a record for the world's shortest time at the Jackson Center. Around 10.30, Lori gave us a break. She handed out fruit and water bottles to the boys and asked me if I wanted anything to drink. A good portion of people with moderate to severe gastroparesis can't drink plain water. When I told my gastroenterologist years ago that every time I drank water, I felt nauseous, bloated, and sometimes threw up, he explained to me that it's a fairly common issue with people with gastroparesis. We can drink water with electrolytes in it, flavored water, hint water, and water pack with flavored packets like Crystal Light mixed in, like this right here, just not plain water. Because I have a GJ tube that drains everything out that I, w- I wouldn't get bloated or vomit if I drink plain water, but I would get extremely nauseous. 
I asked if my mom had sent over any Crystal Light packet mixed into it. Lori quickly called Becky, who brought me over a red, red raspberry ice crystal light packet. Here you are, little princess, she told me. The scullery maid has brought you a handoff delivery of your highness's request. Then she started laughing. But part of her seemed like she was being sarcastic, not teasing. I didn't know what to make of her. She left as soon as she dropped off the packet. Becky was a lot to take in. She had been a little quirky earlier that morning as well, but she was constantly smiling and laughing with us. Was she actually annoyed with me? Did Becky not want to have to bring the crystal light packet? Did she think I really could drink the water bottle plane and was just being picky? Did she think I should have gone over with Lori to get my own crystal light packet? Did she think I just should have waited for the other kids to finish their snacks and drinks and went back to work without drinking anything? Maybe she just had a strange personality? Was she joking? How are you doing so far, Lori asked me as I shook the crystal light packet into my water bottle and began drinking. Okay, I told her. But by the time lunch rolled around, I was exhausted. Eight years of severe gastroparesis and its consequences had not been kind to my body. I was not in the best health by anyone's standards. My heart was always beating faster than it was supposed to. Every time someone took my blood pressure, they told me it was too low. Those EKG tests where they cover you with stickers and wires always came back as abnormal as well. Whenever they drew my blood or looked at my urine, at least seven or eight results always came back abnormal, even when I was feeling fine. Lori led me and the other two boys to the cafeteria. Everyone else was eating pasta with meat sauce, green beans, and mashed potatoes. But one of the timeout staff came over to ask me which of the my drinks I wanted. Okay, one crystal light lemon iced tea coming up, she promised me. Relief flooded through me. I was glad they were being so understanding about this. At lunch, Anne came around to all of us kids that take noon meds. As usual, she did all of the other kids first and then pulled me aside to a quiet air, quieter area of the dining room to put my meds to my J-tube. After lunch, we had academic classes. The math class was geometry, but it was super easy, way beneath my level. The teacher, Meg, had an encouraging smile and an upbeat tone of voice. She came around to make sure everyone knew what they were doing, and I noticed how patient she was with everyone. When she got to me, she put a gentle hand on my shoulder and looked down at my work. You really know your math, she commented. I like math, I told her. What kind of math were you doing before you came here, she asked me. AP calculus, I told her. I'm going to get a hold of some math worksheets that are more on your level, she told me. I want you engaged and challenged, not bored. That sounds fun, I told her. After each section of summer program and each class of school, we had to hand in our point sheets to the teacher and get scored on our behavior and how well we achieved our goals. At the end of the day, we had to hand in our point sheets to the timeout staff. Then house staff came over to the school to bring us back to the across the street to the house and they collected the point sheets to bring with them. How did your first day go? Sam G asked when he met up with me. It was pretty good, I told him. Everyone here seems really nice. I left out the part about how drained and exhausted I felt. We try, Sam G smiled at me brightly. After house meeting, I was so tired. I couldn't even draw. I wasn't used to all of the physical exertion that gardening had required. I sat on the couch with Blinky in my lap and took a few deep breaths. When my mom came up an hour later, I threw myself into her arms. 
It was awesome that I could see her more often now. Hey, kiddo, how you doing? She asked me. Pretty good, I told her. I was actually surprised at how well I was doing mentally. They all seem like good people here. Except for Sam C., I thought to myself. I'm glad my mom pulled me in for a hug. Oh, did you start your new medication, my mom asked me? Bolamictal? Yeah, I took it this morning, I told my mom. We spoke with the psychiatrist here, and he reviewed all your records from the hospitals. Dr. Marie and Tessa and, and he thought that Bolamictal could help you a lot, my mom explained. Okay, I agreed. I had tried so many medications. One more couldn't hurt. I just thought it was funny that we were trying a medication that hadn't been on the list from Dr. Wallace. It also seemed weird to me that my mom had mentioned the Jackson Center getting rec- had not mentioned the Jackson Center getting records or the report from Dr. Wallace. I didn't say anything though. I figured my mom had already sent that over as well. It just hadn't included it in the conversation. The next few weeks fell into a rhythm. I started to get used to the way things worked at the Jackson Center. There were a lot of rules and a rigid routine, but I liked knowing exactly what the schedule would be and how things were going to go. Evenings were fun. I liked all the on-ground activities especially video games, movies, and sometimes the sports outside, which I really enjoyed, even though they quickly exhausted me. I met with Eliza twice a week at first, and I immediately felt comfortable with her. She explained that we'd be meeting individually at least once a week, sometimes more, depending on what I needed. This was on top of the weekly family therapy. She also assured me that she would help me get me through my birthday. It's still a few months away. That's a long time to come up with coping skills, relaxation techniques, time to practice more DBT skills, and just plain strengthen you up. We are preparing for battle, and I am fighting right along with you. So is everyone else at the Jackson Center. Your parents are gearing up for battle, too. At the end of her first session, she hugged me and rubbed my back. She felt like a comforting mother figure to me, and I felt like maybe she could actually help me. And now we switch to the mom's perspective. Mom, Alan and I felt immense relief that Destiny was adjusting to the Jackson Center so well. We were really impressed with all of the staff there, and we both felt like that we had made the right decision. It seemed I was getting glimpses of the destiny that was underneath all of the layers of mental illness. She was smiling a lot more often now, and her smile was cute and infectious. At the end of Destiny's third week at the Jackson Center, we had our weekly family therapy session. We thought we were running late, but Eliza didn't come to get down to get us from the waiting room until about 10 minutes later. She then led us up the narrow staircase and down the narrow hallway to the third door on the left. You guys can sit wherever you want, Eliza gestured to the chairs scattered around the small, almost closet filled with shelves of toys and books, room filled with shelves of toys and books. Alan and I sat in two soft chairs that were next to each other. Individual therapy has been going very well, Eliza assured us. I feel like we have clicked from the get-go. How are you guys doing? We're doing pretty well for the first time in a long time, I told her. Alan and I both feel that we made the right decision. We're so happy that Destiny is doing so well. Now that I met with just the two of you for three weeks, next week we'll have Destiny join in, and the three of us will have a family session where all parties are accounted for, Eliza explained to me. We continue to discuss Destiny's history of mental illness and severe gastroparesis. Even though we told the story a million times to a million different doctors and therapists, 
It was still painful to walk ourselves through it again. After we finished, I felt drained. And when I looked over at Alan, I could tell that he felt the same way. You guys have been through a lot, Eliza commented. You've told me a lot about what's been going on for Destiny. But Destiny is part of a family unit. And what happens to her happens to you guys as well. How have the two of you been coping with all of this? It's been rough, Alan admitted. I nodded. It's very painful to watch our only child struggle so intensely. And the most painful part is that we can't fix her ourselves. Sometimes we get into arguments about how to deal with destiny, I added to Eliza. Our relationship is usually very strong, but when destiny is doing poorly, we find ourselves arguing more. That's perfectly normal, Eliza assured us. I want to help strengthen all of the family bonds, and that includes the bond between you two. We're going to work on honest and authentic communication, and I think that will help make your family stronger. At the end of the therapy session, both Alan and I felt like we had run a marathon, but we also felt hopeful and maybe even a little empowered. Is this an okay time to go over and see Destiny, I asked Eliza, as she led us back down the narrow staircase. All of the receptionists call over to the house and check, Eliza promised us. After a quick phone call, the receptionist gives the okay to head over. Destiny ran into my arms and gave me a big hug, and then gave one to Alan. How are you doing, kiddo? Alan asked her. Pretty good, Destiny told us and smiled. Can I go up to my room with my parents? Destiny asked Eden in the house. I don't see why not, Eden told her. As long as you stay with your parents the whole time. Okay, I will, Destiny promised. She paused at the bottom of the stairs. Going up, she called out. Okay, Eden called back to her. And we went up to her room, which was the first one at the top of the stairs. I smiled again when I saw she had arranged all of her stuffed animals all over her bed and dresser. The room was really looking a lot homier than our hospital room every time I seen it, every time I saw it. Destiny had taped up pictures she had drawn on the wall. Most of them were pictures of Blinky, but she had a few of her other stuffed animals as well. Some of them looked like they'd been done by a professional artist. Your room looks better and better every time I see it, I told Destiny. How's the summer work, pro- work program going? Alan asked Destiny. It's okay, Destiny's voice wasn't very enthusiastic. It just gets very hot out, and I'm kind of getting tired of all those plants. Plus, I get really hot and tired doing it. And lately, it almost makes me feel like I'm going to pass out and get sick from doing it while I'm out there in the hot sun. That doesn't sound very fun, I sympathized. It's not, but I love the teacher. Her name is Lori, and she's really super, super nice, so I don't want to ask to be switched, Dustin explained to us. Well, as long as you're not too unhappy, I guess it's okay, Alan said. How are the staff here, I asked. Oh, they're all super nice, Destiny smiled. On Sunday to Tuesday, the staff are Ken, Tara, and some lady named Penny, who I haven't met yet. She's on vacation in Cape Cod. Then Thursday to Saturday, the staff are Sam G, Kara, and Eden. On Wednesday, there's a combination of staff from the first half of the week and staff from the second half of the week. It changes every Wednesday, Dustin explained to us. My favorite staff are from the second half of the week. I especially like Karen and Kara and Eden, but CMG is cool too. I'm so glad that things are working out here, I told Destiny. My voice caught for a moment and I felt tears welling up in my eyes. Are you okay, Mom? Destiny asked me. Yeah, I'm just really, really happy, I assured her. Me too, Alan chimed in. Before Alan and I left, we played a few rounds of rummy, 
and then hugged Destiny. At the top of the stairs, Destiny stopped again and called out, Going down! Okay! A random voice floated up the stairs, and we descended down. We hugged one more time at the door, and then Alan and I left. It was still hard leaving Destiny there, but a lot easier than leaving Destiny at the hospital. In the car, Alan and I exhaled heavily at exactly the same time. Then we looked at each other. Alan reached his arm over to me where I was sitting in the passenger seat. He pulled me towards him. I leaned into him and rested my head on his shoulder. He smelled clean and smooth. I breathed in his manly scent. I loved that aqua reef old spice. Alan's lips found mine, and I kissed him back with our lips locked together. He caressed my back. A chill of excitement ran down my spine. When we finally broke apart, I told him that we should probably stop and find a better location. We need to keep things PG. We're on a campus with lots of children, I reminded him. Okay, okay, Alan hesitantly agreed. We smoothed and straightened ourselves out and started the drive home. And that is the end of chapter 11 of Saving Destiny. I hope you guys enjoyed this chapter. Please, please, please subscribe and comment and share. Um, I really need to get up to, to 50 subscription, 55, to over 50, over 50 subscribers so then I can... Um, do live streams off my phone, which will make it so much easier for me to do live streams and will avoid all these problems. Also, if you're interested in looking at more of my writing, you can go to www.beccapava.org. But please, please, please subscribe, comment, and share. I would really mean a lot to me. And look at my other videos if you're kind of lost and didn't understand one. This is chapter 11. There's 10 videos of Saving Destiny before this. They're all on my YouTube channel. You can also find them all on www.beccapapa.org. Thank you so much for watching. Love all you guys. And again, I'm so sorry about what happened with the YouTube live stream. I will fix it for next time. Love you guys so much. Bye.